This is nursing care of the child with an alteration in metabolism or endocrine. So the endocrine system, if you remember, this is made up of glands, tissues, clusters of cells that produce or release hormones. Um, the endocrine system is all set up with feedback. So one place makes the hormone, another place triggers its release and usually another place is the feedback turning it on or off so it's multi uh, organs are involved in controlling hormones uh, so hormones do influence all physiologic processes growth development metabolism fluid and electrolytes energy uh, sexual maturation and reproduction response to stress and then maintaining homeostasis. So the organs of the endocrine system, usually um, the most important ones are the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. Those are kind of the control centers that uh, tell the other systems when to release or limit. Um, so our other, uh, other uh, glands are the thyroid, the parathyroid, the adrenal glands, the gonads, the ovaries or the testes, and then the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. And here's just kind of a picture reminding you where all those things are, and it's up in the brain there where our control centers are, our hypothalamus and pituitary. So pituitary disorders uh, are, we're going to talk about growth hormone. You can have uh, too little, a deficiency, or too much, or it can happen too early. So you go through uh, puberty too early, precocious puberty. That's from the anterior uh, pituitary. The posterior pituitary, we have antidiuretic hormone. Yeah, ADH. Um, and you can have too little of that. So you don't stop diuresis and you pee all the time diabetes insipidus or too much of it so you stop diuresing um, so you hold in too much fluid so with growth hormone uh, we want to make sure somebody really has a growth hormone deficiency that they're not just a small person from a small family so we want to uh, rule out any other causes and then document with blood levels that they really do have a growth hormone deficiency and if that's true then we can give them growth hormone it's given as a shot once a day in the evening um, it's if we start the treatment early as soon as we realize they're kind of falling off the growth chart they're not staying up with the other kids on height we can get them to normal height they're never going to be giants but that we can get them to normal or near normal height once uh, the growth plates of the bones, the epiphyses, have um, closed, there's no more growing they can do. So when they hit puberty and those growth plates are closed, that's when we're going to stop giving it. And the way they do that is they take an x-ray of the hand and the wrist, and you can see there's a lot of uh, here that's not um, ossified, right? There's There's it's not hard bone yet it still has growing ability to it so that's how they determine when to stop it uh, so our book doesn't really talk about pituitary hyperfunction but I'm going to talk about it so this is too much growth hormone and it's going to cause overgrowth right this is people who can reach like eight feet tall because of too much uh, growth hormone or if the growth hormone is still being secreted after the growth plates, those epiphyseals, have closed, then you get um, acromegaly. And the way to treat this is to remove or destroy that pituitary that um, secretes the, the growth hormone. And here's some pictures of acromegaly. They tend to get a really big mandible, big jaw, big feet, big hands. So precocious puberty 
Uh, this is sexual development, those secondary sex characteristics before eight in girls and nine in boys. And if you think about that, you know, that's like second grade for little girls, um, second to third grade, right? They don't want to be dealing with periods. They want to be running around playing on the monkey bars. So uh, what we're going to do, we, you know, educate child and family about what is happening, um, teach them about the medication, and then help them deal with self-esteem issues because they are going to feel different. Um, they've gone through these, or they're going through these sex, secondary sexual characteristics uh, before their peers. Um, we can give a monthly injection. It's a sub-Q injection that will stop that um, puberty development. And then when their peers catch up, then we stop it and let puberty happen naturally. So moving on to our antidiuretic uh, hormone issues, DI and SIADH. So diabetes insipidus, this is when you don't have enough antidiuretic hormone. So you let yourself diurese. So you get polyuria and polydipsia, right? Too much pee and you're extremely thirsty because you're peeing so much you're dehydrated. So increased urination, because you're losing water more than electrolytes, you will have hypernatremia. You take, you let all the water leave and the electrolytes stay. It also means the blood will be concentrated. So increased serum osmolality. The urine is almost all water. So you will have a low specific gravity or low osmolality of the urine. Um, very thirsty, dehydrated. What you're missing is um, DDAVP, which is antidiuretic hormone, basically. So we can give that. Uh, you can do, it's a nasal spray, usually given um, in the evenings or at bedtime um, to stop all that peeing during the night. If you have too much antidiuretic hormone, this is stopping you from diuresing. So it's stopping you from peeing. So your urine output's going to be really low, uh, right? Decreased urination. And because you're holding in water, when you do pee, it's going to be fairly concentrated. So you're going to hold in water, which means you're going to dilute the plasma of the blood. So you're going to see a low sodium and low osmolality. Um, the specific gravity of the urine is going to be high because the urine is going to be really concentrated. Increased urine osmolality. So the problem is fluid retention. All that extra fluid, weight gain, all that extra volume in the, the um, vessels, blood vessels, you're going to see increased blood pressure. So we're going to first start by just fluid restriction and correcting the hyponatremia and then um, figure out what is causing it. And or sometimes I've seen either one of these happen after like um, cranial surgery. So as the swelling comes down, it goes back to normal. Okay, so moving on to the thyroid, thyroid disorders in children, right? Again, you can have too much or too little hyperthyroid and if you're thinking your thyroid this is about metabolism right so uh, hyperthyroid is not often in children but when it is it's usually um, graves disease so this is increased thyroid hormones which means increased metabolism so these kids they are hyperactive they are hungry and yet they lose weight they cannot get enough nutrition in. They can't get enough calories to meet this elevated uh, metabolism. Um, they develop uh, protruding eyes. That's um, what that is. Uh, and yeah, the exothalamus. And then uh, the treatment is to destroy the thyroid gland. Often we end up destroying the whole thing and then they have to be on thyroid medicine medication because we've made them hypothyroid uh, and that would be acquired rather than congenital. Some populations do have this higher risks of it congenitally like Downs or uh, if 
it runs in the family, maternal hypothyroidism. Uh, so that's decreased levels. And what we're going to do with that is put you on thyroid supplementation. And you will need to be on that for life. So here's the picture of the protruding eyes. And here's just kind of a comparison, right? That excess thyroid, excess metabolism, your nervous, anxious, diarrhea, intolerant of heat, losing weight, but nice soft skin. Um, hypothyroid, tired, fatigued, constipated, cold intolerance, gaining weight, they get dry, thick skin and some edema and they just don't grow because their metabolism is slow. So parathyroid, uh, when you have hypo parathyroid, so too little uh, parathyroid, it, it's going to goof up your calcium particularly and phosphate kind of goes inverse of calcium. So if you have low parathyroid, you're going to have low calcium, which means high phosphate. Uh, you're going to have increased neuromuscular function which means muscle spasms and cramps tetany right we're going to treat this by giving you calcium and calcium and vitamin d need to be given together if you have too much parathyroidism you're going to have too high of calcium and you're going to end up with low phosphate now you're going to get decreased neuromuscular function this is going to make you tired that fatigue headache irritable we need to restrict calcium, right? Because you have hypercalcium, um, increase fluids, and probably try and decrease that calcium by giving phosphates. Adrenal gland dysfunction. Uh, this has to, right? Your this is about weight gain. Um, we're going to just talk Addison's versus Cushing's. Addison's is too low of corticosteroids, um, too low of cortisol levels in the blood. It's going to make you hyponatremic, uh, hyperkalemic, so low sodium, high potassium. It's going to make you dehydrated. It's going to make you hypoglycemic. Cushing syndrome is going to be the opposite of those. And how do you get this? Well, most of the time it's because we've given you corticosteroids. So this is what happens with long-term steroid use. And sometimes this, I mean, it's not great, but it's better than whatever we're treating those, using those steroids to treat. We, um, this is just some of those adverse reactions, but it's better than not treating whatever the lupus or the rheumatoid arthritis or something else. So with cushion syndrome, you're going to put on weight. You're going to get weight gain. Your uh, blood pressure is going to go up. You are going to be fatigued and irritable, have sleep problems. And if you look back on the other side, that hypoglycemia, this one, you're going to be hyperglycemic, right? Your electrolytes, again, can be out of balance. Um, they tend to get the moon face and a pendulous abdomen with striae, right? The, um, stretch marks and wound uh, s delayed wound healing goes along with it moving on to diabetes let's talk about type 1 versus type 2 so type 1 is a deficiency of insulin uh, from pancreatic damage those beta cells in the islets of Langerhans are destroyed they don't work type 2 is insulin resistance. Your cells are not very good at picking up insulin and getting the sugar off of it. Um, your pancreas isn't great at making insulin, but you do make it. Just not quite enough and the cells aren't very good at using it, which is why we can use an oral hypoglycemic for type 2, which makes your pancreas work better and makes the cells more responsive to insulin. Type 1, that doesn't work. All we can do is give you insulin. Insulin can't be taken orally. It's destroyed by the stomach, so it has to be given sub-Q. Um, so how do you get diabetes? Well, kids who have cystic fibrosis, um, the pancreas often gets destroyed and that's how they get it uh, from you know too much corticosteroids or, or what 
um, other things, some of our syndromes that can go along with gestational diabetes during pregnancy.